time to play ball. Welcome to the podcast with no limits. Whether it be sports, current events, or random thoughts, this is the place to step in and stay a while. Your host is a proud alumnus of Rio Hondo Prep, a former minor league baseball umpire, and a man with strong opinions. Welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast and your host, Matt Persima. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Get Home Safe. Merry Christmas to one and all out there. Very excited, counting down the final couple of weeks until Christmas. I'm recording on Monday morning, bright and early, I might add, but you guys will be hearing this on Tuesday morning, so currently 19 days. By the time this goes to air, it'll be 18 days until Christmas, so are you all ready? You got your cards done, your decorations done, your presents got you wrapped, have you done it all? I sure haven't. I'm a little behind. Uh, got some, got some good progress this weekend. Um, it's a Saturday night, a Sunday. It was it was rather quick as always, but got a, a few things done, mostly around the house, uh, finalizing decorations, going over to my dad's place, helping out there with some decorations. Uh, so I was really in the Christmas spirit this weekend, uh, and then I realized how far behind I truly am. Like, oh, I, I did get some gifts. Place some orders online. That always felt good to check a few boxes, uh, mark off some people on on the uh, on the list, right? But um, some gifts did arrive, and got to get those wrapped. But man, I'm still still a long way to go, and there's still plenty of time. Um, But time is going to go fast. I know that, and um, you know what? Uh, Like it or not, it's coming. It's coming quick. Christmas time is here, and I hope everyone's ready and excited for it. Good morning to all out there. Ah, indeed. Got to have that coffee to start the week off. So uh, a few things today, guys, that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, First of all, kind of the weekend, some Christmas, uh, Christmas cheer, if you will. Again, 18 days until the big day. But uh, I also have a couple of items I want to discuss. First of all, specifically the college football uh, playoff, how championship Saturday rounded out kind of some upsets, uh, some a close game or two here, but it's also some surprising scores really kind of uh, with some blowouts, but uh, I'll, I'll dive into that. And then I'm going to look at the 14 playoff uh, as well as look at the remaining uh, rankings, the, the other 12 or I should say the other eight teams, um, because there have been talks obviously about an expansion in the college football playoff. Um, having 12 teams is kind of the number. Everyone is thinking that way that, you know, those, those top four teams only have to still play. Uh, what would that be? Uh, uh, two, th- or three games, I think, to advance to a, uh, to a national or to win a national championship versus having to play four, like uh, the, the seed five through 12. I think my math would be right on that. Let's see, 12. So those 12 versus five, there's eight teams. So four come out of there. Then it's a, yeah, four on four. Okay. So now that I have that sorted out, uh, I, I like the idea of that. That way you kind of get a, a reward really for being one of those top four seeds and you only got to win three games versus, uh, you know, the, the lower seeded guys having to win uh, four. So it's, I think we're on the cusp of it. I think it's going to happen. I remember years ago, just thinking, man, what if college football had a playoff? It would be so awesome. And uh, I think we're, I think it's on the horizon. It's going to happen soon, but I want to break down uh, the final four as, as uh, signed, I guess, by uh, college football. And then I want to look at, what it would look like if we had that 12 team playoff this year today, I'm going to, I'll break it down for you, give you the matchups and kind of a rundown of uh, what dreams may come. If you will, do you guys remember that movie a uh, long time ago in the nineties, Robin Williams, I think he dies and he goes to heaven. Anyway, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr.'s in it. Uh, good, good movie, uh, crazy movie. But anyway, I'm going to uh, talk about the potential college football games that we could see. We wish we would see. Uh, I'm also going to give you, I jotted this down the other day in honor of a big game this weekend coming up, a standalone game, the army Navy game, uh, great rivalry in, in all of sports. I'm going to list my top 10 college football rivalries. Now that the season is pretty much over, we just have the bowl games and the, uh, the the college football playoff ahead. I, I got me thinking after rivalry weeks, uh, rivalry games a few weeks ago. Man, what are the best rivalries in college football? So I'm going to give you my top ten there, and then as promised, I am going to give you a Christmas top ten list. Last week we did movies, got some good feedback on that. 
uh, got some, uh, some arguments, if you will, also kind of uh, behind the scenes off the air. But today I'm going to give you my top 10 favorite uh, Christmas songs. There's going to be uh, some, some debate here, I'm sure. Uh, the thing about songs is there's so many of them. There's, there's, there's really a limited number of Christmas movies, but Christmas songs, uh, there, there's just hundreds of them. And so uh, I just picked out a few that I like that kind of every year I kind of, you know, maybe bob my head to a little bit, maybe get a little emotional, whatever. Uh, but just to me, they, they speak of uh, the greatness of the Christmas season. So t- I, I, it's hard to limit it to just 10. Quite honestly, there's a ton more. And, and the other thing with Christmas music is there's a song that is play right in the original version. And then there's other arrangements maybe another artist does it a country version a a a, a instrumental version only love the instrumental music christmas music going on uh here at the house uh, while while uh christmas decorations are up or even a football game's on i i don't need the announcers telling me uh, how smart they are in in football i i much prefer just having a little christmas music going and uh, enjoying the evening so that's the plan today give you my top 10 college football rivalries Give me a top, give you the top 10 list of uh, my, my favorite Christmas songs. And then uh, let's see what else that should be it for today. Kind of a brief show. Uh, I'm recording Monday. This will be out later today. I'm going to record with our guest for Friday, which I want to tell you guys about right now. I'm going to be interviewing Cole Barrett, who is a Rio Hondo prep alum. All of his kids played in care youth league and Rio Hondo prep. His wife, uh, Julian Barrett was on the show uh, months ago. So that was a lot of fun talking with her. And we got to talk with Cole because, uh, you know, I, I'm, we're going to get into all this with him, but Cole is a huge Atlanta Braves fan and he's corrupted his children uh, to, to like the Braves as well. And yes, we all know the Braves won their World Series this year after the uh, tough, disappointing season last year, blowing a three to one lead to the Dodgers They uh, in the NLCS. This year, they did finish that. Uh, series off and then went on to win the world series so a lot to be uh, happy about in the barrett household and on top of all that for some reason cole is a michigan football fan a michigan fan in general i'm sure uh so i gotta talk to him about that because michigan not only beat ohio state last week but this weekend they crushed iowa in the big 10 championship game so michigan is all the way up to number two in the country and will face georgia in the college football playoffs so i gotta talk to cole about his atlanta braves his michigan wolverines and uh, that should cover a lot on friday as well as uh, discussing kind of cole's uh, career what it's like uh, life on the road he's a long haul big rig uh, trucker i don't know all the official terms but he'll tell me all about that so a man on the road who's always listening to, I'm sure, sports and, and watching it when he can, as well as spending a lot of time with his wonderful family. So that is our guest on Friday, and, and I hope you guys tune in for that. Last week, Scott Weidman, uh, the dry sense of humor he has, the uh, witty Weidman, yeah, that should have been the title, but that was a lot of fun. If you have, have not had a chance to uh, listen to that, please go back and do so. But anyway, that's what's on on deck here on Friday, again, with our new format, Tuesdays and Fridays here on the Get Home Safe podcast. All right, let's look at the Saturday that was college football championship Saturday. Uh, The big games, obviously, were the SEC championship, the Big 12 championship, the the Big 10 championship, uh, but there was championships in, in all the conferences, really, and it started off on Friday night with kind of a surprising uh, upset in the fact that Utah, number 17 ranked, went, uh, well, it was a neutral site up in Santa Clara, I think, but uh, they beat up uh, University of Oregon 38 to 10, and I would argue uh, it wasn't that close. Excuse me, the game was played in Las Vegas at the new Allegiant Stadium up there, the uh, the Death Star, the Raiders Raider Stadium. I think I think Vegas is a great place for the, uh, the Pac-12 uh, championships. I think they do that in basketball too. I was bummed when they moved it out of Staples Center because that was cool to be able to go to. But uh, Vegas truly is a neutral site for all the Pac-12 uh, schools. Uh, case in point, did you also hear that the? It, lo- it looks like the Oakland A's might seriously end up in Las Vegas, and they I saw some blueprints or some replicas of uh, of uh, what the stadium could be, the new baseball stadium. Woo, Las Vegas sports man heating up. But it was the Utah Utes taking down the Oregon Ducks, thirty-eight to ten on Friday night. 
Utah scored early and often, and uh, man, congrats to them on a Pac-12 championship. They will play in the Rose Bowl against Ohio State here in Pasadena. There's going to be a lot of red come New Year's Day. Hope everyone's ready for that. That should be a really fun matchup. Uh, who does Urban Meyer root for in that game? Uh, you know, the former Utah and Ohio State coach. So uh, congrats to Utah Utes. Their first, might be their first ever Rose Bowl. I'm trying to think, I should have I should have known that. But anyway, um, Utah, the Utah Utes, your uh, 2021 Pac-12 champion. Uh, great program they have there and seeing what they've done over the years has been pretty awesome. So uh, to uh, the Saturday slate of games, we go and, there was another team from Utah that uh, kind of surprised some people, had a massive upset, I would say. Utah State, the Aggies, uh, taking down the Aztecs from San Diego State, 46-13. to 13. Utah State improved to 10-3. and three. This was San Diego State's second loss of the season. So Utah State is your Mountain West champions. I don't know who had that on their scorecard, but congrats to the Aggies, man. They, again, they took it to San Diego State. I have bragged about the Aztecs earlier in the year saying, you know, uh, they might be one of the best team in Southern California with UCLA and SC, of course, uh, not having great seasons. And um, man, they just, just had a bad day. Had They, they fell flat on Saturday and uh, not a good time to, to not show up. So San Diego state uh, does not win the mountain West, but it is in fact the Utah state Aggies. So congrats to them. Uh, the game of the day. Oh my goodness. I saw most of this game, the big 12 championship, Baylor and Oklahoma State, if you don't think football comes down to a game of inches sometimes, or you don't think uh, the small things matter, just think of the last game you lost by a point, or in, in this case on Saturday, by literally inches. Let me paint a picture for you. Baylor takes the lead on Oklahoma State. Uh, by a few touchdown, Oklahoma State rallies back. And, and keep in mind, uh, Oklahoma State with one loss, uh, ranked five at the time was had an outside shot to get in the college football playoff might have gotten in had they won but it was Baylor who held on to win the big 12 championship uh, Oklahoma State got up the field down by five got to after a pass interference call got to the two yard line first and goal at the two with about a minute left run play couldn't get in another run play couldn't get in they go they try to pass it incomplete pass fourth and goal from the one yard line for the big 12 championship with like 30 seconds left or something. And uh, Oklahoma state runs the ball. They started inside. It looked like the, uh, the outside contain kind of fell, uh, fell inside and, and wasn't going to be able to contain the running back. He busted to the outside and it was a race for the pylon him and the defender. And I thought initially he had it. He was going to beat the guy to the corner. Uh, the defender recovered nicely the uh, Oklahoma state cowboy dove for all he was worth to tore the pylon. And he had the ball in his hand and the, the ball missed the pylon by inches. I mean, inches and uh, a great call by the official on the field to rule him short. Baylor holds on and wins the game. Um, uh, an incredible finish. I love defense. You guys know this. And that's a play that won't show up in any fantasy sports league or whatever. But that to me is what football is all about those type of highlights, not some fancy long touchdown pass or, uh, you know, whatever that it's plays like that, that make football. The guy kind of got caught inside. looks like he wasn't going to be able to do his job. Hustled, made a great play and uh, saved Baylor's big 12 title hope. So the Baylor bears at 11 and two win the big 12 championship and Oklahoma state falls to 11 and two as the runner up and does not get a spot in the college football playoff. So, uh, who is the, uh, the Baylor head, not Manny Diaz. That's the Miami guy. Oh, my head, my, my head is all over the place. Uh, Dave, 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 Dave. Um, get, definitely getting some looks from other, other schools. Um, but man, what a, what a seat, what a Baylor sports has really kind of, I mean, they won the, the, the basketball championship, uh, last year, uh, beating, who was that Houston, Dave Aranda. Hello. The, uh, Baylor head coach. Uh, he's definitely getting some interest from, uh, other schools. Indeed. Uh, did a, did a great job at LSU as their coordinator for a while, but, uh, he's done a heck of a job at Baylor. Um, they're going to be a top 10 team for sure. Uh, with finishing of their season 
and uh, the Big 12 champs. Georgia, Alabama, everyone thought Georgia, you know, hey, this is their year undefeated. They're going to they're gonna finally beat Alabama and uh, win the SEC title. Well, not so fast, my friends. As Lee Corsa would say, the Alabama Crimson Tide just continue to roll. And uh, they just know how to show up in the biggest games. I don't know how they constantly do it. They have struggled offensively all year. And all they do is put up 41 points against uh, an incredible Georgia defense on Saturday. Uh, just came out of nowhere. And uh, poor Georgia Bulldog fans just got to be scratching their heads why they can't beat these guys. But they are going to get another shot, at least if Georgia and Bama are able to win their playoff games and advance to the national championship game. They both got in. And I think rightfully so, if your only loss is to uh, now the number one team in the country by uh, it was a couple touchdowns, 41, 24. Um, I think Georgia is one of the top four teams and uh, sorry, Notre Dame. Sorry. Uh, was there anyone else with one loss? I don't think so. I, I think the committee got it right here uh, with Notre Dame losing at home to Cincinnati an undefeated team, mind you. Uh, but still, I think uh, Georgia's a better team than uh, Notre Dame. And I just wish we, we could play these things out, right? There was a, a set uh, criteria. Hey, win your conference. First of all, there should be no independence in college football. This whole independent thing, BYU is joining the big 12. Good for them. Notre Dame has been independent forever. They need to join a conference. This is getting ridiculous, but anyway, that's a separate story. Okay, speaking of Cincinnati, they fell behind a little bit early, but they rallied and uh, took down the Houston Cougars 35 to 20 to win the American Athletic Conference. Uh, remember, Cincinnati and Houston, both these teams will actually be in the Big 12 in a couple of years when Oklahoma and Texas leave. So uh, two good teams here. Uh, to me, this was going to be the game of the day with an 11 and 1 Houston team going up against a 12 and 0 uh, Cincinnati team. And, and the game really did uh, live up to uh, to the records there. But uh, Cincinnati has done it. They've, they've gone undefeated. They are going to get a shot in the big uh, college football playoff, I should say, up against number one, Alabama. So uh, Alabama is a two touchdown favorite already. This is a big chance here. This is uh, one of the lower seated, uh, I should say, lower what tier, lower conference uh, teams to ever get in the college football playoff. So they're going to get a shot. The Boise States of the world would have loved this opportunity, right, to play in the, uh, the playoff game up against um, a juggernaut like Alabama. So hopefully Cincinnati shows up, makes it close. Uh, you know, you know, they're going to be uh, playing hard and uh, Luke fickle, right. Is their coach. I mean, he's going to have those guys ready. I'm sure. But Nick Saban is still the best in the business. Okay. Uh, Big 10 championship, Michigan dominates Iowa. I mean, 42 to three, you don't see these scores in championship games. I thought maybe there'd be a letdown for Michigan after the big win against Ohio state for the first time in what a decade. Uh, but no, they took it to Iowa and Iowa is always scrappy, always tough to only give up three points to those guys. Uh, it's really something. I mean, Iowa has not had a great offense all year. That's for sure. But Michigan just to roll in there, uh, hail the victors. Indeed. They are ready to uh, make some noise. I think here in the postseason, and they will face Georgia in the college football playoff. That should be an awesome game. Can't wait for that one. Uh, in some other games uh, throughout the championship Saturday, Pittsburgh beat Wake Forest 45-21. It's kind of like these are the two teams. And I don't know. These are the two teams in the ACC. You know, Clemson's got to get back and another team. Miami's got to get things together. They, they need to get rolling again. The college football is better when Miami is, uh, is uh, one of the top teams uh, out there. So the rumors are, and maybe by the press time when this is released, that uh, the uh, Mario Cristobal, Oregon coach, may in fact end up at Miami. He's a Miami grad, a lot of history there. I think he has family there. So that all, all signs seem to be pointing there. And, you know, I want to speak about the, the coaching hires, the coaching process uh, of hiring uh, coaches away. College football needs to fix this somehow. It's not the coach's fault. It's not the administration's fault. I just think it's the timing. When you have this early signing period where guys can sign in, in what, December or, or even January, uh, coaches have to get out there and recruit teams need answers right away. So you have this weird situation, which is different than any other sport where coaches get hired away before the season is officially over. It'd be nice to be able to finish your season and then go about your business recruiting uh, for your new school or whatever, wherever you end up. But like Brian Kelly leaving LSU, Lincoln Riley leaving uh, Oklahoma, um, 
uh, Brett Venables, defensive coordinator headed to Oklahoma uh, from uh, Clemson. I mean, it's just, it's just odd. The timing of it, you put pressure on guys. If you don't make a move, if you, if you leave the school, you're abandoning them and then they have to like, you know, scrab, scramble to find something. It's just odd. And, and again, it's not the coach's fault. If, if you're going to be offered a hundred million dollars, who out there would not be like, Oh, you're going to pay me how much? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you, where do I sign? I'll, I'll, I'll be right there. I mean, it, it's just nuts when, you know, the, the coaches talk all this talk about loyalty and, and sticking together and everything. And then they have to, they're put in a situation where they have to leave. Uh, and again, they don't have to leave, but to not to, to turn something down, big money or whatever, uh, a big opportunity. I don't think there's many of us that would do that. I mean, so anyway, the, they, they got to fix the, maybe get rid of the early signing period. I don't know. I don't know what the, the whole process, but it's just kind of ugly. And I feel bad for the teams, for the, for the players, for the coaches that have to go through this because it's hard enough changing jobs, change, bringing in a, a new regime and, and putting together a football program. I think college football is kind of getting in its own way here. But anyway, so those are those are kind of a, a brief recap of some championship games. So uh, what I want to tell you right now is look at the the 12 team possible playoff. I went based off of the final college football playoff rankings. However, they do that. Uh, Alabama one, Michigan two, Georgia three, Cincinnati four. So we are going to see Bama, Cincinnati, Michigan, Georgia in the college football playoff. New Year's Eve, I believe. Uh, let's see down in uh, Dallas in the cotton bowl and the other side is the orange bowl. I want to say, I should know this looked it all up yesterday, but Oh, well, uh, Oregon and Oklahoma play in a bowl game. That's pretty awesome. My good friend, Steve Amon up in uh, Eugene. And of course the Clark family, uh, good friends indeed. I'm sure maybe they'll have a little, little, uh, private wager on that game that I'll be watching that one for sure. But here's what the, uh, rankings five through 12, 12 were. We know the top four. Uh, five through 12 went as follows. Notre Dame, five. Ohio State, six. Baylor, seven. Ole Miss, eight. Oklahoma State, nine. Michigan State, 10. Utah, 11. And Pitt, 12. Okay, after that, uh, the 13th team, which I will mention, was BYU, an independent. Okay, you have to also think about the other conference winners um, from the lower tier conferences. Utah State uh, from the Mountain West. Texas San Antonio from Conference USA, Northern Illinois from the MAC, and Louisiana from the Sun Belt. Now you're saying, Matt, why are you mentioning those names? Well, in a perfect world, ideally, we would see a 16-team playoff. I think that is perfect. It's it's a nice even number. Um, I'll settle for 12. I get it. But ideally, in my vision, my mind is, if you have however many conferences that is why have all these teams in division one football if only a handful of teams can compete for a national championship now will will northern illinois win a national championship no but if you win the mac or utah state you win the mountain west why shouldn't you get an opportunity to go into the dance see what you can do maybe win a college football playoff game over a, a big school and some would argue oh that's what the bowl games are for okay fine but i just like the concept of conference champions getting to play. Now, if you if you had those conference automatic bursts from these lower tier conferences, you'd have to go to 16 because you can't have uh Louisiana be uh, you know, the not the the the, the 12th ranked team in the country. You know, these are lower tier conferences for sure, right? Um so ideally they would get a shot with the 16. But um and again, the Pac-12 champion, uh, Utah, uh, Pittsburgh, the, the ACC champion, they are uh, actually ranked in the top 12. But say they weren't. Say, you know, do you put the automatic teams in there, the automatic berth? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would like to see automatic berth for winning your conference, no matter how bad your conference is. Uh, and if it's one team, it's one team. But here's what, what it would look like if we had the 12-team playoff. The four teams who are the top four who are actually playing in the college football playoff they uh, would have the opening round off. And what we would see is Notre Dame against Pitt, five versus 12, Ohio State against Utah, which we are going to, in fact, see in the Rose Bowl. Um, but imagine that being a playoff game. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, Baylor against Michigan State, the green machine, a battle of uh, the, the, the different shades of green. That would be awesome. And then finally, Old Miss and Oklahoma State. 
some personalities there on the sideline between uh, Lane Kiffin and Mike Gundy for sure. Um, that would be our that would be our playoff. That would be the teams that uh, would advance or would 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 participate in a playoff. Um, man, and then the winners, those four winners of those games, would then play Alabama, Michigan, Georgia, or Cincinnati, and that we'd probably after those games end up exactly where we're at anyway with the the four top seeds. But hey, one can dream, right? One can dream. So I would love it. I would think. Uh, Notre Dame beats Pitt, Utah beats Ohio State. I would go uh, Baylor beating Michigan State and probably uh, Ole Miss beating Oklahoma State. And so then we'd have the great eight after that. The great eight, elite eight, if you will. So uh, anyway, uh, one can dream. I wish that's what we had. It's not what we have. Oh, well, we live, we learn, we move on. While we're talking about college football, I wanted to offer up my top 10 college football rivalries. Now, I know there's going to be people out there who disagree with me on this, and that's fine. That's, you know, we live in a world of disagreement. At least we uh, should be able to get along with disagreement. There's no problem with that. Um, everyone thinks their rivalry matters more and is more important, right? Um, and there's a few teams on here that you're like, why are you even bringing them up? They're not relevant. They're not good. I'm talking about all time over time what 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 these rivalries mean to different parts of the country why it's a special rivalry um and there'll be a few people that oh arkansas and uh, whoever that's a you know okay i know there, there's a hundred and something college football teams Every, there, everyone has a rival and everyone thinks theirs is, is the biggest and, and best so at least from my taste from my standpoint here's what i think are the top 10 college football rivalries Again, over time, sorry, I don't have Princeton and Yale on here. I know that's a rivalry or whatever, whoever those Ivy League teams were. Back in the day, man, back in the day, those were big time games, but uh, no longer. Anyway, I still wouldn't mind going to see a rivalry game of uh, whoever. Uh, but yeah, these are some games that I actually wouldn't mind getting to uh, at some point. But uh, and, and here's why I think they are the top rivalries in all of college football. Okay, number 10, the Holy War. Ooh, that was buzzer coffee buzzer uh the, number 10 the holy war byu against utah matt how can you have these shoes what come on your west coast bias uh, maybe a little bit uh byu and utah obviously byu uh, a mormon school utah is a state school these two schools are not far from each other less than an hour and uh this is the entire state of utah really is divided this way and um, it's the holy war because even though BYU is the Mormon school and Utah isn't really a, a religious affiliation, there's a lot of uh, just Mormon people in the state of Utah. So it's a huge game. They, they play it early in the year, which I think is awesome. Like week one or two, usually great way to open the season. And I've worked baseball games at BYU and um, there's definitely a, a sense of you feel that rivalry year round. Uh, at BYU and Utah and back in the day they were in the Mountain West Conference together and it was played at like the end of the season and it was usually snow or cold and it was just like to see the crowd at that game on TV it was just like okay this is a different level this this game matters uh, and and it and it divides families like a lot of uh, rivalries do but this one to me, when you in that in Utah, typically, if you grow up there, very family based or, you know, very Mormon based, not too many people leave, uh, in my opinion, to other parts of the country from Utah. You kind of stay there. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but BYU, Utah, number 10, the Holy War, always a great game. Number nine, Johnny, Utah, number nine, uh, Alabama versus LSU. Now, you could say there's a ton of SEC games uh, and rivalries that are a big deal, you know, down in the South, that region of the country is just, it's, uh, it's life and death. It's, uh, it's God and country, it's college football. It's, uh, it's, it's just bigger than everything. And I really want to get down there and watch some games, but Alabama and LSU, uh, the, the two Nick Saban schools uh, down there, you know, two of those, one of those, those two, I should say, seems to always be in the mix for like the national championship. So that game is like a pseudo playoff game every year. Um, it's always, you know, the national game, whether it's uh, a late night down in uh, a night game in Baton Rouge or a daytime CBS game, 
uh, in, in Tuscaloosa. It's just a cool scene. And I think that game matters more every year than other games, other rivalries. It's not too often where Alabama and LSU are not good, not very good. We're not competing for a national championship. I know LSU's had some rough times. Alabama's been good forever, but usually, and I say usually, these two teams meet up and uh, it, it decides uh, their division of the SEC and who, who usually ends up in the SEC championship game um, based off of this game. So always fun, especially when they're both good, a top five matchup usually. Alabama and LSU, for, for your money, if you're looking for – a, a top ranked matchup every year. You probably can't go wrong with this one year in and year out. Number eight, this game no longer happens, which disappoints me, but from a straight history standpoint of college football, this one speaks to me, uh, the traditions, the pageantry, um, just the fights to the battle of the two, two of the best fight songs for sure. Notre Dame and Michigan. This was always like week two of the season. Notre Dame and Michigan aren't too far apart. Uh, South Bend and uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan aren't aren't too far apart. Indeed, um, usually again early in the season, week two. A lot of times in throughout history, anyway, that game was always uh, premier matchups early in the season. Usually ranked pretty high. A lot of hype always around Notre Dame and Michigan. Um, it was always the one day a year I rooted for Michigan. Uh, and so some really fun matchups, even when Michigan was was bad and Notre Dame had some rough years. That game was always hyped up, and I wish they'd bring it back. I wish I wish they would because I think college football needs that game. Two amazing fight songs, two great programs, and where they're at today, hey, number two and number five in the country, uh, ranking-wise, pretty impressive after some lean years. But traditionally, Notre Dame and Michigan, I mean, that just – I don't know. You say those two, those two names, and you just – man, college football. Yeah, the history of college football. Um, so anyway – that's uh, my opinion. I wish they'd have that game back. Uh, number seven, I'm sticking with Notre Dame. Again, I, I, I have to dislike Notre Dame because I'm a USC fan, but um, Notre Dame does have a rich tradition. It's a very different school than and anyone else in the country, um, but they're on the list back to back here. And that is because uh, the USC, uh, USC Notre Dame rivalry, I think is very unique in the sense that it's most of these rivalries are schools that are pretty close to each other. This one is uh, across the country, not all the way, of course, Indiana and uh, Los Angeles uh, couldn't be more different uh, parts of the country, uh, Los Angeles versus South Bend, Indiana. Um, but this rivalry has gone on a long time. I think again, to the history of this game, uh, the fact that when it's played in Los Angeles, it's usually it's the last game of the year in November. When it's played at Notre Dame, it's in the middle of the season in October. Uh, that's just kind of the time frame of how that works out. But uh, the tradition of USC and the tradition of Notre Dame, if you look back at all the national titles and the great success of both programs, it's similar to the Michigan-Notre Dame rivalry. But uh, Notre Dame and USC, uh, again, unique in the sense that it's uh, two – uh, religious institutions, even though USC people don't think of that. When I first started, I believe it was a Presbyterian university or college or something, but I don't know how the rivalry started. I probably should have looked that up, but it's the fight, the, the battle for the shillelagh. Um, look that up. It's a very interesting trophy, but USC, Michigan, USC, excuse me, USC, Notre Dame, the game that is played uh, every year, except for the COVID year, of course, when they played the, you know, two games or whatever they did, but Notre Dame and USC, uh, I have high on my list. Well, not high. This list isn't that long. But anyway, uh, number seven, USC, Notre Dame. Uh, again, if you're not a fan of either or you hate both or you hate one, this is the game you kind of tune into every year to see uh, if they lose to their to their rivals. Uh, number six, Red River Shootout, Texas versus Oklahoma. Uh, the Red River separates the state, right? The two states. This game is played on a neutral field every year at the Cotton Bowl, the old Cotton Bowl. And when you got all these brand new state, that's an old stadium. You got all these brand new state of the art stadiums, and then you play at the Cotton Bowl. It seems like a very crowded game, very crowded event, uh, indeed. And you have the Texas State Fair, I think, going on. So there's all kinds of great food and um, activities going on there. But uh, usually an early game, I think, a 11 a.m. Uh, kickoff. There in Dallas and uh, Texas and, and Oklahoma, you see those two colors, the burn orange and that crimson from the sky. 
of all the, the color of the, uh, the fans, you, you know, uh, gear and uniforms and stuff. It's a pretty cool sight to see. And it usually is a shootout because they don't play much defense in the, uh, the big 12 anymore, but Texas, Oklahoma, this game used to be similar to Alabama LSU back in the day in the sense that it used to mean a lot more as far as uh, the national scene, usually a top 10 matchup. Um, but uh, Texas and Oklahoma, well, Texas has seen better days. Uh, Oklahoma is still usually in the hunt, usually in the mix. And uh, they're going to be just fine with their new hire of Clemson defensive coordinator, Brent Venables. But the Texas OU rivalry is a, is a, a darn good one. And one that I definitely tune into every year. Number five, USC versus UCLA. Okay, I know. West Coast bias. Yes, maybe a little. But, uh, and two awful teams uh, the past few years. But there's no other rivalry in college football that plays in the same city. Two schools from the same city. Not just the same conference. Not just the same region of the country. Same state. Same city. 11 miles apart, I think. And I know Westwood and South Central are, <laughs> are definitely uh, polar opposites of each other. But whether this game is played at the Coliseum or the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, always a sight to see. I loved years ago when they decided that each team would wear their home jerseys for this game. Um, really cool to see that because back in the day, uh, UCLA played at the Coliseum as well, and they both wore their home uniforms. Um, it's just special that way. It's the inter inner city cross town showdown, um, a huge game for recruits. Usually there's a ton of high school kids, um, you know, recruits who are kind of deciding one way or another, uh, which school to go to after that day. And it's a, it's a city championship. I've been to a, a few of them. It, it, it's really, you almost have like a small town feel to it. Like, uh, you rivalries and other side of the tracks type of deal. And, uh, just a really fun game every single year, even when they're awful. Sometimes one team's really good. One team's really bad. And it's a spoiler. Um, more often than not, it's kind of decided who goes to the Rose bowl, um, between USC and UCLA. I'd like to see it get back to that hopefully here soon. And with Lincoln Riley being the, uh, the new USC coach, I think uh, good things are ahead for the Trojans. So, uh, USC on this list twice, um, just my opinion. Don't hold it against me. Just my opinion. USC against UCLA and USC against Notre Dame, two of the best rivalries in college football. Okay, to our top four. Uh, number four, Florida and Georgia, the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, as they call it. Um, the Florida, Georgia, obviously border is a big deal. And this game is played on a neutral site as well in Jacksonville every year where the uh, the Jaguars play. Uh, all, all, all tell field or something. I can't, don't remember, but, um, that's probably, uh, the most significant football game played in Jacksonville every year. Sorry, Jaguars, but, uh, Florida, Georgia, again, Georgia has been rolling the past few years. Florida's had uh, better days, but it is in fact, uh, a heck of a game, heck of a rivalry sec country, right? Um, just, uh, really cool game. I would love to get to the world's uh, apparently this tailgate before the game is just a huge deal. And, uh, the, the rivalry is real. I mean, Florida people are like, Oh, you're from Georgia or Georgia. Oh, you're from Florida. Like it's a, it's a real thing. It, it's pretty cool to see. And uh, this is definitely a game I would love to get to sometime because it's usually middle of the season, right? It's in Florida. It's like, okay, good weather. Life is good. Uh, everyone's out there having a great time before the game. And only one team has a good time after the game. Uh, number three, Ohio state and Michigan, the big game. I think it's, is it the big game or is it just the game? I can't remember. No, I think it's the big game, but uh, Ohio state and Michigan uh, mortal enemies. I mean, this game is fierce. This game is intense. Michigan people despise Ohio state people and vice versa. I have two good friends, Luther Wilson and uh, Bob Gordon, and uh, they're, they're, they're great buddies and everything. But when you start talking Michigan, Ohio state, Oh boy, it is on. I mean, Luther is relentless because Ohio state has just put a pounding on Michigan over the past few years. Uh, but Michigan did win this year. Uh, great win for the Wolverines and for Harbaugh and company. Um, but man, that game is fun to watch every year. It's usually 9 a.m. out here on the West Coast. Uh, the weather just starts to get a little chilly for us, chilly to our standards. And that game's like played in the snow or freezing, freezing cold. And so you flip that on and you're just like, this is what rivalries are all about, really. You know, two teams that absolutely hate each other. And, you know, whether it's staged or not, whether it's, it's real or not, or you just hate the, the uniform, not the people. I mean, it's, it's been rather, rather intense 
and uh, one of the most intense rivalries I will say that is out there. Um, you know, second or, or should I say third, only to a couple more on my list. But Ohio State, Michigan, this was really what got um, the juices flowing for me when I saw this game a few weeks back. And was like, you know what, what are some other amazing rivalries in college football? Because Ohio State, Michigan uh, is, I mean, when you think of rivalries, that's, that's really what you think about. So a great game. I'd love to get to it sometime. If it wasn't played in such cold weather there in, uh, in uh, Ann Arbor or, uh, or a call, like, where, where's Ohio State? Um, Columbus. Hello. Uh, anyway, sorry. Let more coffee, more coffee needed. So Ohio State, Michigan, number three on my list. At number two. I have the Iron Bowl, Alabama and Auburn. This game in probably the past 10, 15 years uh, really has decided uh, who kind of goes to the SEC championship game. Uh, Alabama obviously wins a lot of these games over Auburn, but who can forget Cam Newton's year? Scam Newton uh, really put it together and, um, and had a great season, undefeated season. Uh, beating Alabama, the the kick six. What was the kid's name? Uh, when when Alabama tried tie game, Alabama tried a long field goal for the win. It was short. Um, Auburn kid ran it back 109 yards or whatever for the uh, walk off kick six, walk off touchdown. One of the most exciting plays ever in college football, really. Um, but Auburn and Alabama. When you're born in Alabama, I mean, this is sometimes it's decided before birth which side. Uh, you're on. I have a good friend who uh, went to Auburn and uh, told told me all about the rivalry and, and what it means. Uh, Auburn is a private university, I believe, and Alabama is a state school. And so there's just so much passion and pride in uh, in this game and in these institutions. It is a year long, uh, a year long battle, really, a uh, year long battle cry. War Eagle for uh, Auburn and Roll Tide for uh, Alabama. So. I don't think you can go wrong with this game. It's always at the end of the year, last game of the season, Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, no matter where it's played, this game is just usually a big deal, um, especially when Auburn is a little better than they have been these past few years uh, when Alabama is always good. But man, when, when Auburn is, is, is up, even when they're not playing that well, like this year's game uh, was pretty good for a short while. Anyway, Auburn steps up for the Alabama game, the iron bowl. I think Michigan state, Ohio state, is definitely the, the nastiest and the, 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 t- the teams just despise each other. This one's, this one's right up there too. But where I think this one separates is just uh, the fan bases, the fan bases. This is life or death 365 y- days a year, beat Alabama, beat Auburn. And uh, I definitely would love to get down to this game sometime uh, in the future. Okay. Number one, it's a game this Saturday. It's a standalone game. It's probably the most unique uh, of all of the rivalries and that is army versus navy the west point cadets up against the naval academy the midshipmen this rivalry goes back forever um it is a game that uh, is always played after the championships um it's that just a standalone game when there's no, nothing else going on it's played this saturday at uh, noon i think is it 9 a.m our time maybe noon and anyway it's uh it's just so special when you consider these two teams, they they're, they're fighting against each other. Um, but once the final horn sounds and they go off into their careers as uh, officers, um, they're going to be working together. They're going to be fighting for us. And it's just unique that way. I don't think you're going to see you ever see a game that where there's more effort uh, people care more. There's mutual respect, but just heated passion, competitiveness. They want to beat each other. And it's a sad sight, but also a joyous sight at the end of the game. Both alma maters are sung. And the losing team um, goes in front of their band. Actually, both teams go over to the band. And uh, for the losing team, they play their alma mater and the losing team sings it. And the, the other team stands there respectfully. And then the winning team after that, everyone goes to the other end of the field, both teams, and the winning team gets to sing second. So my good friend, Maynard Bajorquez, who's a West Point graduate, he always would say, yeah, our goal is always sing second. We want to sing second. 
And uh, man, it's beat go army, beat Navy, uh, go Navy, beat army. It's just, it's all over the campus. I've, I've had the opportunity to tour the campuses and, uh, and it's just been awesome to see that there is that vibe at all times. These are people that are going to serve us and protect us and go in, go into the military as leaders, but there's still this concern for athletics, especially football and beating your rivals. So a very unique uh, game. Indeed. Usually the president shows up. Um, it's, it's played on a neutral field in, I think Philadelphia, cause it kind of sits um, kind of in the middle of the two campuses in, in NFL stadium. So it's usually in Philadelphia. It's also been played in uh, New Jersey at the uh, giants and uh, Jets stadium. It's been played in Baltimore at the Raven stadium before, but it's always a neutral site and uh, just a game for the ages. You're going to see a lot of running, running the football, if you will, with the, uh, the triple option attack. Now many passes thrown in the army Navy game. Uh, so it's a quick game. It's like two hours and 20 minutes, usually uh, just a lot of fun to watch, man. I love, uh, old school football. It takes you back a little bit and the uniforms are usually awesome. Just camo helmets or, um, just awesome Navy army uniforms. I don't think you can go wrong. This is on my bucket list. I got to get to an army Navy game one day, uh, somehow, some way I will get there and, uh, can't wait to do that someday. So guys, that's my top 10 list of the rivalries. Maybe you had them in different orders, or maybe you have and what about Oregon, Oregon State? What about, you know, what, you know, sorry, guys, I had to put this list together somehow, but these are just games that I find intriguing and I try to tune into every year, regardless of the records. So I am going to take a sip of coffee here. And then uh, I had another top 10 list for you to wrap up our show with today. You know, I'm a very visual guy. I like to see uh, progress or see a lack of progress. It kind of is what motivates me in, in certain areas in my life. And I just love seeing the Christmas stuff up. It gets me kind of going. Um, you know, you walk in the door and the lights are on and you come home late at night and it's just nice to see the Christmas stuff up. I think maybe that's why I love this time of year is there's other decorations, there's other uh, traditions and things you do, but uh, there's something special about Christmas. Again, it's, it's very unique and my favorite holiday holiday season, if you will, and what I wanted to do the, these few weeks leading up to Christmas again is to put up a little top 10 list of some Christmas uh, topics. Last week we did movies and uh, this week I have for you, I'm going to do music. I'm going to do my favorite top 10 songs. Now there's a few that are left off of here that um, I'm like, oh, that's a good song. Oh, that's a good song. Oh yeah. This version is, is okay. But these are just songs that I kind of thought about uh Definitely when I hear them at Christmas time, I'm like, okay, now it's Christmas. When I hear this song, usually I'm like, okay, now it's officially Christmas season uh, when you hear these songs. So here's my top 10 uh, favorite Christmas songs. And if, again, if you have any, you want to challenge, you want to throw some my way, be like, how could you leave off this one? Or, hey, or, hey, this is my favorite Christmas song or list of them. By all means, you know how to reach, how to reach me. I would love to uh, hear your responses. But here we go. My top 10 Christmas songs as we lead up to December 25th. Uh, number 10, I love O Come All Ye Faithful, uh, no matter how it's played or sung. Um, probably my favorite Christmas hymn in general. Um, but the version by Nat King Cole is, uh, it's old school. It's just classic. It's, I mean, there's nothing really, it, it's special, but there's nothing really special about it. It's just very well sung. Um, Nat King Cole, you can't go wrong with him, man. Great, great Christmas uh Christmas mix, a lot of Christmas songs uh, from him that are just phenomenal. But Oh, Come All You Faithful, Nat King Cole, number 10 on my list. At number nine, Little Drummer Boy by Pentonix. Now, Pentonix does a lot of awesome songs with their uh, acapella sound. And, and, you know, I love Straight No Chaser. They're pretty awesome as well. Um, put out some great Christmas uh, songs and albums. But there's something about the Little Drummer Boy. Again, a song that is very common, has been played or sung by many different people, but the Pentonix version uh, really gets you, gets you kind of going, gets you like, okay, it's like, it, it, it's a song that builds, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's good pace, and just kind of gets you, gets you a little fired up, I'm like, yeah, yeah, Christmas is here, all right, so Little Drummer Boy from Pentonix, number eight, Michael Buble, The More You Give, this one's a pretty upbeat song, uh, it's a song that you, you turn up in your car when you're driving, um, 
I think Michael Buble's Christmas album, Christmas stuff, you could have on in the house and uh, at any time. And it's, it's, it's awesome. But this song, The More You Give by Michael Buble, uh, one that I really, really enjoy. Uh, number seven, kind of different sound, but Christmas Canon. Um, I remember hearing this song for the first time uh, by Trans-Siberian Orchestra, by the way, Christmas Canon. Um, and it has kind of the, the choir and the, the background and there's different versions of this, but um, I heard this song. I always remember this for some reason. I was going to communion down at Care Youth Church. It was just me and my mom, Christmas Eve. We were getting in the car. We kind of bundled up and uh, jumped in the car to head down to, to care real quick and do communion. And this song came on. I remember it just, it was dark. It was cold and uh, Christmas canon with that kind of slow intro. Uh, it always makes me think of kind of driving down there with my mom on Christmas Eve to do communion. Um, I don't know why, but it does. And uh, one of my favorite songs, I like, uh, what is it? Canon anyway. Oh, what's the original? Acapella. I don't know, but Christmas Canon by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, number seven on my list. Number six, Josh Groban and Believe from the Polar Express, one of my favorite Christmas books as a kid. The movie was okay. Honestly, I much prefer uh, the book. We Every Christmas Eve, we'd read the Polar Express. It came in this nice set. We had a uh, really nice binded book, had, had a bell in there, which if you don't know the story, you know, read up on it and see why there's a bell in there but it had a a tape a cassette tape that you plugged in and it read the book to you as you turned the pages and and saw the uh the pictures and things just one of the most imaginative uh memories i have from from childhood but uh, josh groban believe great song um that is unrecognized is, is very recognizable uh as soon as it comes on with the the intro and kind of just this peaceful I don't know. Peaceful. It gets you going. Gets you going for Christmas for sure. Top five. Let's roll right into our top five. That number five, another Michael Bublé song, uh, Cold December Night. Again, pretty catchy. Got some good, good, uh, I don't know, good beats to it. Good, uh, good pace. And uh, just talking about, you know, Cold December Night. Again, two kind of non, uh, what would you say, I guess, secular, non-religious sounding songs but uh you know they're they're very good in the sense of i think they paint a picture of the lifestyle of christmas really so cold december night for um number five from michael buble and that's the last thing last time buble is on here i promise uh number four this one's uh unique and it's on here for a reason but uh all alone on christmas by darlene love if that sounds familiar it's because it's from home alone 2 when kevin goes and he's kind of wandering the city by himself. It starts with these, these giant bells, bells going. Let me see if I can, actually, I'm going to pull it up for you guys. And I think it's the Easy Street Band that is, that is playing it with uh, Darlene Love. Uh, incredible saxophone solo uh, during it that I absolutely love. Let me see if I can find it real quick. All right, let's see. I got it. Yeah, there we go. The bells. Killer saxophone man. Kevin McAllister walking the streets of New York, right? All the money in his bag. And what's cool in this is the uh, MC is on top of the Twin Towers, which are along with it, but kind of pretty cool in the top. Of the Love this song, man. Woo. That's All Alone on Christmas by Darlene Love. Uh, pretty solid song. And uh, yeah, I love Home Alone too. So, uh, and Home Alone, the original, as you guys learned last week. So what is my number uh, three song? Okay, number three song. Oh, this one's a tearjerker, but a good one. Uh, Christmas Shoes by a new song. Um, I cannot hear that song for obvious reasons without getting a little emotional. Um, but a, a powerful song that um, is, uh, yeah, sentimental reasons, obviously. But um, Christmas Shoes is a really cool song. Just a, it's sad, but it, it, it gives you the, 
the hope and the, um, how do I say this? It, it, it's what Christmas is all about, really. If, if you had to sum up a song, maybe that kind of opened your eyes, made you a little bit more cheerful, made you appreciate the things you have. I think Christmas Shoes by New Song will put things in perspective for you and maybe uh, make you be more uh, appreciative and celebrate the great uh, the great holiday of Christmas, uh, if you will. So uh, number three, Christmas Shoes, one of my favorite Christmas songs. Number two, Carol of the Bells by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Now, I love Carol of the Bells, no matter how it's played, but with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, with the guitar intro and everything, oh man, that is that is good stuff. Uh, you can't go wrong with that. Carol, again, Carol of the Bells um, by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Let me see here, pull it up here. I know I didn't see, I didn't have the ability to do this before, and now I do for uh, some reason. Let me see. I can pull this up. I love, I love the intro. There'll be a, there'll be a ad, I'm sure. Yep, of course, there's an ad. But the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, man, that. I want to see them in concert sometime. That would be so cool. It would be so cool to see them in concert. Oh, yeah. Intro with the bells. Or the, uh, what is that? Violin? That's my ringtone, I think. And just how the guitars come in. and the, Oh, man. It, it, it takes off on you. Love this song. trans and uh, Carol of the Bells. And again, Carol of the Bells can be played so many different ways. Acapella. I've heard it with actual bells, which is not easy to do, but a great. This is like my Christmas shopping. Let's go. Let's go. Anyway, that is uh, my number two favorite song for Christmas. Carol of the Bells by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Need to see those guys in concert. And number one on my list is a song that kind of hit me last year. It got me. I don't know. It tugged at the heartstrings a little bit, um, but it's a really good Christmas song by a, an a outstanding artist. It's uh, "Light of the World" by Laura, uh, by Lauren Daigle, and um, if you haven't heard this song, uh, I would encourage you to do so because it is a song that, um, if you're not a religious person, I still think um, I still think it'll do something for you. Um, it, it certainly did for me. Every time I hear it, I get, uh, again, it, it reminds me of what Christmas is all about. It's not just about giving gifts. It's not just about, um, it's not just about decorations and, uh, you know, good, good food and bad food for us. It's about um, our Lord and Savior being born in a manger. Uh, and being the light of the world that Christmas night. And it, it gets me every time. I, I like it. Uh, she has some really good uh, other songs as well. But this song just builds and builds and builds. And by the end of it, I mean, if you're not thankful for, uh, for Christ coming, coming to this earth and saving us, then, uh, then I don't know, uh, maybe listen to it again. But uh, Light of the World by Lauren Daigle, currently my favorite Christmas song. Um, starts soft, builds, and just by the end of it, um, it's Christmas time. I'll tell you that. So that's my top 10 list, guys, of, of uh, songs, Christmas songs. I'm sure more will come about, but uh, I just, uh, man, for, for, for me, Christmas time is just so special, and I love doing this stuff. I love talking Christmas and, and not being ashamed of it. I mean, we cooked some good food the other day or uh, the other night. Actually, it was Valerie, of course, who does all the work. But uh, she made like this chili cheese waffle that was phenomenal. Uh, we loaded kind of waffle, not without syrup and stuff. It's just this time of year where you can experiment with different things. And it's just a lot of fun to, uh, to do so. So uh, Merry Christmas to everyone out there. Hopefully you uh, take a listen to one of these songs uh, throughout your week and uh, maybe agree or disagree. It's all good. These are just these are just my tastes. These are my flavors. But if you have some Christmas songs you think I should hear that I probably haven't, oh man, please send them to me. I'm always looking for for good tunes, uh, for good 
good sounds uh, as we get closer and closer to Christmas. So that'll wrap up today's show, guys. I really appreciate you tuning in on a Tuesday with me and just hearing me ramble away about my opinions about possible college football playoff expansion, uh, you know, the, the top 10 rivalries in college football, and, of course, my top 10 favorite Christmas songs. Didn't even get to the NFL or other things. The Rams actually won a game. It wasn't the Jaguars, so I don't even know if that counts. But um, next week I'll be back with more uh, sports talk and random topics here on the Get Home Safe podcast, our Tuesday edition, as well as another top 10 Christmas list. Of, uh, of, of a topic that I will bring to you guys, but I need to step aside now and uh, start recording with Mr. Cole Barrett uh, for our show on Friday. Can't wait for that. And I hope you guys will tune in to listen to uh, Cole talk about his Braves, his Michigan Wolverines and, and other th- topics. You don't want to miss that show on Friday, but uh, guys have a great rest of your week. Looking forward to seeing you guys or uh, talking and however that's supposed to happen. I'm not really seeing you guys, but you know what I mean. It's been a long morning. Looking forward to you guys joining us on Friday with the Cole Barrett interview. Have a great Christmas. Good luck out there, guys, with the shopping and just the craziness that is. Uh, put a Christmas song on and hopefully it makes you feel a little bit better. Uh, but guys, as always, no matter what you're doing, whether you're out on the town or around in third base, get home safe. Hope I'll come